Our main reading this morning is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning to read verse 21. And you can follow this in the Church Bible on page 1007. Mark, chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you. His disciple answered, And yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he'd put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means... Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give us something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear Lord, we do pray that those words we've just sung would become a reality in our hearts now as we turn to your most holy word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, please do be seated and do turn with me to that reading uh, from Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 5. Find this on page 1007. In contrast to the great politicians of the past, what is noticeably absent from the politicians of today is great rhetoric. Speeches which would stir the soul and fire the imagination. Sound bites just don't do that. And so in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s, when many of the Western nations were brought to their knees, including the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in his inaugural presidential address, said these words, This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. The only thing to fear is fear itself. Brilliant. You see, Roosevelt was tapping into a very real and common emotion, fear. 
in order to overcome it by replacing it with what, in effect, was faith. And fear does have all sorts of dreadful effects on us as individuals and as communities. Fear makes us lose perspective and question the value of the fight. For Christians, fear makes us doubt God. And this is especially the case when we're afraid of losing someone we love, surrendering to the fear of death. And this is certainly the case with the man in our gospel episode this morning, Jairus. So I want us to look at this very moving and penetrating story into three headings. First of all, the call for help, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now, Jairus, we're told, is a synagogue ruler. Now, this is a fact which is repeatedly stressed throughout the story. And it may not mean much to you, but it meant an awful lot at the time to Jairus and those who were around him. Because it meant that this was the most important man in town. You see, the synagogue was more or less the glue that held everything together, as it was the center of religion, it was the center of education, and it was the center of civic leadership and social activity. And consequently, what we have here with Jairus is a man who wields a lot of power. He is Mr. Mover and Shaker. He's the highest ranking professor, the bishop, and the mayor all rolled into one. So if you were to see Jairus walking down the street, you would look on in holy envy, and you would say to yourself, he's got it all. Jairus was the kind of man who gives favors, not the kind who asks for them. But not this day. The man who had it all would willingly give it all in a heartbeat for the one he cherished above all else his little 12-year-old daughter who lay at home fighting a losing battle for her life. That's the language used to describe her condition. She's as good as dead. And that is how she's going to end up unless Jesus comes to help. And as we look at Jairus hurriedly making his way to Jesus, his breathing ragged through physical exhaustion, his voice choking with fear and anxiety. We don't see the oh-so-nice, neatly-groomed, self-confident leader who had all the answers. Rather, we see a blind man begging for a handout. And he falls at Jesus' feet with his knees in the dirt, and that would have been a first for him. And furthermore, we're told that he pleaded earnestly with him A better rendering would be he pleaded again and again and again. And what did he plead? My little daughter's dying. My little daughter's dying. My little daughter's dying, Jesus. And between the muffled sobs, straining through tear-filled eyes, he looks up in desperation at the carpenter and begs, please come. And just put your hands on her, and she'll be healed, and she'll live. Now, don't notice that Jairus does not barter with Jesus. You do me a favor, and I'll make sure you'll be taken care of for the rest of your life. He doesn't negotiate with Jesus. I know the rich and powerful back in Jerusalem have got it in for you, Jesus. They're giving you some trouble. But I tell you what, you handle my problem and I will handle yours. I'll call in a few favors. And he doesn't make excuses to Jesus. Normally, Jesus, I'm not this desperate. I can usually take care of my own. But I do have a small problem I'd like you to help me out with. No, he he just pleads. 
And which father wouldn't? The love of your life is slipping away. The one you've tenderly cared for and seen take her first few steps, slowly growing, now looks as if she'll never reach womanhood. No coming of age, no graduation, no marriage, no grandchildren, in short, no future. And it may well be that is exactly the situation you find yourself in this morning. You too are being eaten away by anxiety and fear. It's just not knowing that's the killer. How will the children turn out? What will the diagnosis be? Will my marriage survive? Is there an employment just around the corner? We're so fearful when it comes to the future, and it can drive us to distraction, just as it did with Jairus, in fact. But notice what Jairus does. He comes to the one who is able to shape that future, and he asks for help. And Jesus gives it. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him. And the sense of relief which would have swept over that man at this point must have been immense. The nightmare may turn out to have a fairy tale ending after all. And then would you believe it? Jesus stops halfway and will not budge until he finds out who touched him. Touched him? Well, the whole crowd is pressing against you, Jesus. My daughter's dying, and all you can be bothered about is who touched you. And then when he does find out who did touch him, Jesus decides to have a conversation with her there and then. And that is beyond irritating. That is irresponsible. Now, can you imagine an ambulance team who's just picked up a heart attack victim on their way to A&D, and then they see someone they'd taken to hospital uh, for a routine examination the week before. They decide to pull over and have a conversation with them to see how they're doing. You don't do that sort of thing. Now, can you imagine the intense agony of the interruption for Jairus? The clock is ticking and Jesus is talking. And again, is that not true to experience? Your prayers seem to be answered. And then, boom! The unforeseen interruption knocks you sideways and you're back to square one. And you ask, just what's going on? Why is God doing this to me? Well, here in this story, we see just what God is doing as we come to the second heading, a call to trust. Look at verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, it's at this stage in the story that everything gets turned on its head. Jesus goes from being led to doing the leading, from being convinced by Jairus to convincing Jairus, from being admired to being laughed at, from helping people out to throwing people out. Now, notice how Jesus takes charge. When the delegation arrives, they tell Jesus, Jairus, not to bother Jesus anymore. After all, it's too late. What can he do? The girl's dead. And what does Jesus do? He totally ignores them. And in so doing, he underscores an important principle when it comes to faith. To go with the unseen rather than the seen, you sometimes have to ignore people. Those who say it can't be done. Those who say that God's given up on us. Those who say that society's gone to the dogs and all we've got to do now is batten down the hatches and wait for the second coming. The question is, who are we going to listen to? The crowd or Christ? And sometimes we have to make that simple choice. And so Jesus turns to Jairus to plead with him. 
Don't be afraid, he says, just believe. So you have the negative, don't allow what you see and hear overwhelm you. And then you've got the positive, believe. And that's what faith is. Replacing cowardice with courage. Turning your gaze from the circumstances to the Lord who is the one over those circumstances. A father in the Bahamas cried out a similar plea to his son who was trapped in a burning building. The two-story structure was engulfed in flames and the family, father, mother and several children, were on their way out when the smallest boy panicked and he ran back upstairs. And his father outside shouted to him, jump son, I'll catch you. And the little boy who was scared witless cried out, but daddy, I can't see you. I know his father reassured him, but I can see you. The father could see, although the son could not. And it's like that with God and us. We have a father, a heavenly father, who can see the future when we can hardly cope with the present. A similar expression of trust in the God who can see even when everything seems dark was found on a wall of the concentration camp. And it read, I believe in the sun even though it doesn't shine. I believe in love even when it isn't shown. I believe in God even when he doesn't speak. Now tell me what eyes could possibly see good in the midst of such appalling evil? Well, eyes which could see the unseen, the eyes of faith. And that is the choice being presented to Jairus and often to us. To see only the hurt or to see the healer. To be overtaken by the fear of the future or to walk with Jesus into that future. Well, Jairus chose the latter. And that's when Jesus encounters a group of mourners there in verse 38. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. Now, you've got to try and imagine the scene here. It is one of complete pandemonium. You see, in addition to the uncontrollable grief of the family and the neighbors, in this culture, professional mourners also turned up and they were hired to enable people to express that grief. And they would come with pipes and drums and a lot, and they made such an unholy racket. So the whole atmosphere as Jesus enters into that house is one of abject despair, with people beside themselves wailing with grief. And that is quite understandable, isn't it? On the basis of what they could see, death is a disaster. On the basis of what Jesus is going to do, death is a deliverance. And so when Jesus says, why all this commotion, the child is not dead but just sleeping, well, that's just too much for some people. Their response, they laugh at him. Big mistake. Big mistake. You do not laugh at Jesus. And you do not laugh at him when he's in earnest. The pain of this family is serious, and that is no laughing matter. And just how serious Jesus is, we discover by looking at what he does next in verse 40. After he had put them all out. That is too weak a translation. It literally reads, after throwing them out. So it doesn't ask people politely, would they mind moving to the next room while uh, Jesus and his parents could have a bit of quiet together? No. He takes them by the collar and the belt and he throws them out. It's the same verb used 38 times in the gospel to describe Jesus casting out demons. That's what he does. Now, why the force? Well, the answer, I think, is simply this. When we are being asked to put our trust in Jesus at the moment of crisis, then the last thing we need, and the last thing this family needs, is the distraction of doubt. 
On the one hand, Jesus bids, trust me. On the other hand, the crowd's saying, don't be a fool. And God is not going to allow the noise of the critics to distract those who are his. And so we come to the call for hope in verse 40. After he'd thrown them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give us something to eat. Now, why did Jesus say that the little girl was asleep when she was painfully dead? Well, it was because from his perspective and the perspective of all those who put their trust in him, that is all death is. It's sleep. It is a temporary condition and not a final state. For those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the experience of death is like the experience of waking up from a deep sleep and seeing Jesus there before you, gently holding your hand. And this is such a delicate picture that Mark is painting here as related by Peter who was standing there watching these extraordinary events unfold. Jesus kneels down beside the bed and he takes the little girl's hand between his hands and says two things which are deeply significant. First of all, he says Talitha. And it's really a pet name. It's a, it's a term of endearment, like when we say little darling or sweetie. And then it's followed by a command, kum, get up, not come back from the dead. And it's a phrase her mum and dad would have used pretty well every morning as they knocked on her bedroom door. Sweetie, it's time to get up, it's time to go to school. Now, do you realize what this means? It means that Jesus' power over death is as easy as waking a little child from her sleep. Now, do you not think it's worth trusting someone who has that kind of power? Don't you think it's worth committing yourself to someone who exhibit, exhibits that kind of tenderness? But just as we saw in the story of the healing of the leper, a foreshadowing of the cross as God's means of cleansing sin, so here we see a foreshadowing of the cross as God's way of defeating death. This is the way Dr. Tim Keller puts it. There is nothing more frightening for a child than to lose the hand of the parent in a crowd or in the dark. But that is nothing compared with Jesus' own loss. He lost his father's hand on the cross. He went into the tomb so that we can be raised out of it. He lost hold of his father's hand so that we could know that once he has us by his hand, he will never, never forsake us. Now, I've told this story before to some of you, but it's so insightful I want to tell it again. As to why we can trust Jesus when we need him the most, which is at the point of death. Bishop Burgrave of Oslo, who was placed under house arrest by the Nazis in 1940, was once asked, can you explain death to us? He says, I'll try. And he told this story. He said, once there was a peasant who one morning said to his wife and son, I've got to go to the next village, but I promise I'll be back before sunset. And his little five-year-old boy begged him to take him with him, and so eventually the Father agreed. And the father grabbed the chubby little hand and, and off they set. And they came to the river, they had to cross, swollen because of the rain, and such was the torrent that it had washed away the bridge, and all that was left was a heap of pilings. And the little boy, his face a picture of panic, exclaimed, Father, we shall never get across that. 
and holding his wrist tightly, he susp- his father suspended him at periods over the rapids, stepping from post to post until eventually got, they got to the other side. And so on they went. But the business took longer than was expected, and by the time they set off home, it was dark. No moon, no stars. And as they walked along the road, the little boy started to cry. And through muffled sobs, he explained to his father the cause of his tears. We crossed the river in daylight, but we will never make it in the dark. Without saying a word, the father scooped up his little boy and pressed him close to his heart, and in a moment, he was fast asleep. The next thing the little lad knew was waking up in his bed, with his father standing in the doorway and light streaming into his bedroom. It was morning. And Bishop Burgrave said this, that is what death is like for the Christian. What you fear, you never experience. Now you may say, well, it's a nice story, Melvin. But does it make any real difference in the here and now? Well, yes, it does. So let me give you an example of the hope the story of Jairus' daughter gives to a Christian believer. And the example comes from the life of the great German reformer, Martin Luther. Now, Luther had several children with his dear wife, Katie, but without doubt, Magdalene was Luther's favorite. And her death at the age of 13, one year older than Jairus' daughter, almost drove him to despair, and would have had it not been for his Christian faith. In September 1542, as Magdalene lay dying, Luther, weeping almost uncontrollably at her bedside, asked her, Magdalene, my my dear little daughter, would you like to stay here with your father? Or would you be willing to go to your father yonder? Magdalene answered, Darling father, as God wills. And Luther wept. And holding her in his arms, he prayed that God would free her. And then she died. At the funeral service, which Luther himself conducted, with his daughter laid out there in in the coffin, he declared, Darling Lena, you will rise and shine like a star, yea, like the sun. I am happy in spirit, but the flesh is sorrowful and weak and will not be content. The parting grieves me beyond measure. I have sent a saint to heaven. And you know what the first words were she probably heard from risen Lord Jesus as she stepped from this world to the next. Talitha Kuhn, darling, get up. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, you know better than any of us, of the heartaches that we experience and have experienced. And there can be no greater heartache than this. But Lord, we thank you for the tenderness and the wonder of this glorious story which in your mercy you have preserved for us. We thank you, Lord, that we can be people who can call to you in help for help. We can be people who can trust you. And we can be people who have hope. Dear Lord, in a world which is devoid of hope, dear Father, we pray that we would treasure these things as we seek to walk humbly with you. For your dear name's sake. Amen.